Story seven of The House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life, the Story of a Provincial, Parts twelve and thirteen. Part twelve. When I was busy in the garden or the yard, Moisey would stand with his hands behind his back and stare at me impertinently with his little eyes and this used to irritate me to such an extent that I would put aside my work and go away. We learned from Stepan that Moisey had been Mrs. Cheprakov's lover. I noticed that when people went to her for money they used to apply to Moisey first, and once I saw a peasant, a charcoal burner, black all over, grovel at his feet. Sometimes, after a whispered conversation, Moisey would hand over the money himself, without saying anything to his mistress, from which I concluded that the transaction was settled on his own account. He used to shoot in our garden, under our very windows, steal food from our larder, borrow our horses without leave, and we were furious, feeling that Dubechnia was no longer ours, and Masha used to go pale and say, have we to live another year and a half with these creatures? Ivan Cheprakov, the son, was a guard on the railway. During the winter he got very thin and weak, so that he got drunk on one glass of vodka and felt cold out of the sun. He hated wearing his guard's uniform and was ashamed of it, but found his job profitable because he could steal candles and sell them. My new position gave him a mixed feeling of astonishment envy, and vague hope that something of the sort might happen to him. He used to follow Masha with admiring eyes, and to ask me what I had for dinner nowadays, and his ugly, emaciated face used to wear a sweet, sad expression, and he used to twitch his fingers as though he could feel my happiness with them. I say, little prophet, he would say excitedly, lighting and relighting his cigarette. He always made a mess wherever he stood, because he used to waste a whole box of matches on one cigarette. I say, my life is about as beastly as it could be. Every little squirt of a soldier can shout, here, guard, here. I have such a lot in the trains, and you know mine's a rotten life. My mother has ruined me. I heard a doctor say in the train, if the parents are loose, their children become drunkards or criminals. That's it. Once he came staggering into the yard. His eyes wandered aimlessly, and he breathed heavily. He laughed and cried, and said something in a kind of frenzy, and through his thickly uttered words I could only hear, My mother! Where is my mother? and he wailed like a child, crying, because it has lost its mother in a crowd. I led him away into the garden and laid him down under a tree, and all that day and through the night Masha and I took it in turns to stay with him. He was sick, and Masha looked with disgust at his pale, wet face and said, Are we to have these creatures on the place for another year and a half? It is awful, awful and what a lot of trouble the peasants gave us! How many disappointments we had at the outset, in the spring, when we so longed to be happy! My wife built a school. I designed the school for sixty boys, and the Zemsto Council approved the design, but recommended our building the school at Kurlovka, the big village, only three miles away. Besides Kurilovka school, where the children of four villages, including that of Dubechnia, were taught, was old and inadequate, and the floor was so rotten that the children were afraid to walk on it. At the end of March, Masha, by her own desire, was appointed trustee of the Kurilovka school, and at the beginning of April we called three parish meetings, and persuaded the peasants that the school was old and inadequate, and that it was necessary to build a new one. A member of the Zemsto Council and the elementary school inspector came down too and addressed them. After each meeting we were mobbed and asked for a pail of vodka. We felt stifled in the crowd and soon got tired and returned home, dissatisfied and rather abashed. At last the peasants allotted a site for the school and undertook to cart the materials from the town and as soon as the spring corn was sown, on the very first Sunday, carts set out from Kurilovka and Dubechnia to fetch the bricks for the foundations. 
They went at dawn and returned late in the evening. The peasants were drunk and said they were tired out. The rain and the cold continued, as though deliberately, all through May. The roads were spoiled and deep in mud. When the carts came from town, they usually drove, to our horror, into our yard. A horse would appear in the gate, straddling its forelegs, with its big belly heaving. Before it came into the yard, it would strain and heave, and after it would come a ten-yard beam on a four-wheeled wagon, wet and slimy, alongside it, wrapped up to keep the rain out, never looking where he was going and splashing through the puddles, a peasant would walk with the skirt of his coat tucked up in his belt. Another cart would appear with planks, then a third with a beam, then a fourth, and the yard in front of the house would gradually be blocked up with horses, beams, planks. Peasants, men and women, with their heads wrapped up and their skirts tucked up, would stare morosely at our windows, kick up a row, and insist on the lady of the house coming out to them, and they would curse and swear. And in a corner Moisey would stand, and it seemed to us that he delighted in our discomfiture. "'We won't cart any more,' the peasants shouted. "'We are tired to death. Let her go and cart it herself.' pale and scared, thinking they would any minute break into the house, Masha would send them money for a pail of vodka, after which the noise would die down and the long beams would go jolting out of the yard. When I went to look at the building, my wife would get agitated and say, "'The peasants are furious. They might do something to you. No, wait, I'll go with you.' We used to drive over to Kurilovka together, and then the carpenters would ask for tips. The framework was ready for the foundations to be laid, but the masons never came, and when at last the masons did come, it was apparent that there was no sand. Somehow it had been forgotten that sand was wanted. Taking advantage of our helplessness, the peasants asked thirty kopecks a load, although it was less than a quarter of a mile from the building to the river where the sand was to be fetched, and more than five hundred loads were needed. There were endless misunderstandings, wrangles, and continual begging. My wife was indignant, and the building contractor, Petrov, an old man of seventy, took her by the hand and said, "'You look here, look here. Just get me sand, and I'll find ten men and have the work done in two days. Look here.' Sand was brought, but two, four days, a week passed, and still there yawned a ditch where the foundations were to be. "'I shall go mad!' cried my wife furiously. "'What wretches they are! What wretches!' During these disturbances Victor Ivanitch used to come and see us. He used to bring hampers of wine and dainties, and eat for a long time, and then go to sleep on the terrace, and snore, so that the labourers shook their heads and said, "'He's all right!' Masha took no pleasure in his visits. She did not believe in him, and yet she used to ask for his advice. When, after a sound sleep after dinner, he got up out of humour and spoke disparagingly of our domestic arrangements, and said he was sorry he had ever bought Dubechnia, which had cost him so much, and poor Masha looked miserably anxious and complained to him, he would yawn and say the peasants ought to be flogged. He called our marriage and the life we were living a comedy, and used to say it was a caprice, a whimsy. She did the same sort of thing once before, he told me. She fancied herself as an opera singer and ran away from me. It took me two months to find her, and, my dear fellow, I wasted a thousand roubles on telegrams alone. He had dropped calling me a sectarian or the house-painter, and no longer approved of my life as a working man, but he used to say, "'You are a queer fish, an abnormality. I don't venture to prophesy, but you will end badly.' Masha slept poorly at nights, and would sit by the window of our bedroom thinking. She no longer laughed and made faces at supper. I suffered, and when it rained, every drop cut into my heart like a bullet, and I could have gone on my knees to Masha and apologized for the weather. When the peasants made a row in the yard, I felt that it was my fault. I would sit for hours in one place, 
thinking only how splendid and how wonderful Masha was. I loved her passionately, and I was enraptured by everything she did and said. Her taste was for quiet indoor occupation. She loved to read for hours and to study. She, who knew about farm work only from books, surprised us all by her knowledge, and the advice she gave was always useful, and when applied was never in vain, and in addition she had the fineness, the taste, and the good sense, the very sound sense, which only very well-bred people possess. To such a woman, with her healthy, orderly mind, the chaotic environment with its petty cares and dirty tittle-tattle in which we lived was very painful. I could see that, and I, too, could not sleep at night. My brain whirled, and I could hardly choke back my tears. I tossed about, not knowing what to do. I used to rush to town and bring Masha books, newspapers, sweets, flowers, and I used to go fishing with Stepan dragging for hours neck deep in cold water in the rain to catch an eel by way of varying our fare i used humbly to ask the peasants not to shout and i gave them vodka bribed them promised them anything they asked and what a lot of other foolish things i did at last the rain stopped the earth dried up i used to get up in the morning and go into the garden dew shining on the flowers birds and insects shrilling, not a cloud in the sky, and the garden, the meadow, the river, were so beautiful, perfect but for the memory of the peasants and the carts and the engineer. Masha and I used to drive out in a car to see how the oats were coming on. She drove and I sat behind. Her shoulders were always a little hunched, and the wind would play with her hair. "'Keep to the right!' she shouted to the passers-by. "'You are like a coachman,' I once said to her. "'Perhaps. My grandfather, my father's father, was a coachman. Didn't you know?' she asked, turning round, and immediately she began to mimic the way the coachmen shout and sing. "'Thank God!' I thought as I listened to her. "'Thank God!' And again I remember the peasants, the carts, the engineer. End of Part 12 Part 13 Dr. Blagovo came over on a bicycle. My sister began to come often. Once more we talked of manual labor and progress, and the mysterious cross awaiting humanity in the remote future. The doctor did not like our life, because it interfered with our discussions, and he said it was unworthy of a free man to plow and reap and breed cattle, and that in time all such elementary forms of the struggle for existence would be left to animals and machines, while men would devote themselves exclusively to scientific investigation. And my sister always asked me to let her go home earlier, and if she stayed late or for the night, she was greatly distressed. "'Good gracious, what a baby you are!' Masha used to say reproachfully. "'It is quite ridiculous.' "'Yes, it is absurd,' my sister would agree. "'I admit it is absurd. But what can I do if I have not the power to control myself? It always seems to me that I am doing wrong.' During the haymaking, my body, not being used to it, ached all over. Sitting on the terrace in the evening, I would suddenly fall asleep, and they would all laugh at me. They would wake me up and make me sit down to supper. I would be overcome with drowsiness, and in a stupor saw lights, faces, plates, and heard voices without understanding what they were saying and I used to get up early in the morning and take my scythe or go to the school and work there all day. When I was at home on holidays, I noticed that my wife and sister were hiding something from me and even seemed to be avoiding me. My wife was tender with me as always, but she had some new thought of her own which she did not communicate to me. Certainly her exasperation with the peasants had increased, and life was growing harder and harder for her, but she no longer complained to me. She talked more readily to the doctor than to me, and I could not understand why. It was the custom in our province for the laborers to come to the farm in the evenings to be treated to vodka, even the girls having a glass. We did not keep the custom. 
The haymakers and the women used to come into the yard and stay until late in the evening, waiting for vodka, and then they went away cursing. And then Masha used to frown and relapse into silence, or whisper irritably to the doctor, "'Savages! Barbarians!' Newcomers to the villages were received ungraciously, almost with hostility, like new arrivals at a school. At first we were looked upon as foolish, soft-headed people who had bought the estate because we did not know what to do with our money. We were laughed at. The peasants grazed their cattle in our pasture and even in our garden, drove our cows and horses into the village, and then came and asked for compensation. The whole village used to come into our yard and declare loudly that in mowing we had cut the border of common land, which did not belong to us, and as we did not know our boundaries exactly, we used to take their word for it and pay a fine. But afterward it appeared that we had been in the right. They used to bark the young lime-trees in our woods. A Dubechnia peasant, a money-lender who sold vodka without a license, bribed our laborers to help him cheat us in the most treacherous way. He substituted old wheels for the new on our wagons, stole our ploughing yokes, and sold them back to us, and so on. But worst of all was the building at Kurilovka. There the women at night stole planks, bricks, tiles, iron. The bailiff and his assistants made a search. The women were each fined two roubles by the village council, and then the whole lot of them got drunk on the money. When Masha found out, she would say to the doctor and my sister, "'What beasts! It is horrible, horrible!' And more than once I heard her say she was sorry she had decided to build the school. "'You must understand,' the doctor tried to point out, "'that if you build a school or undertake any good work, it is not for the peasants, but for the sake of culture and the future. The worse the peasants are, the more reason there is for building a school do understand. There was a loss of confidence in his voice, and it seemed to me that he hated the peasants as much as Masha. Masha used often to go to the mill with my sister, and they would say jokingly that they were going to have a look at Stepan because he was so handsome. Stepan, it appeared, was reserved and silent only with men, and in the company of women was free and talkative. Once, when I went down to the river to bathe, I involuntarily overheard a conversation. Masha and Cleopatra, both in white, were sitting on the bank under the broad shade of a willow, and Stepan was standing near with his hands behind his back, saying, "'But are peasants human beings? Not they. They are, excuse me, brutes, beasts, and thieves. What does a peasant's life consist of? Eating and drinking?' crying for cheaper food, bawling in taverns, without decent conversation or behavior or manners, just an ignorant beast. He lives in filth, his wife and children live in filth, he sleeps in his clothes, takes the potatoes out of the soup with his fingers, drinks down a black beetle with his kvass, because he won't trouble to fish it out. "'It is because of their poverty,' protested my sister. "'What poverty?' Of course there is want, but there are different kinds of necessity. If a man is in prison, or is blind, say, or has lost his legs, then he is in a bad way, and God help him. But if he is at liberty and in command of his senses, if he has eyes and hands and strength, then, good God, what more does he want? It is lamentable, my lady, ignorance, but not poverty." If you kind people, with your education, out of charity, try to help him, then he will spend your money in drink, like the swine he is, or worse still, he will open a tavern and begin to rob the people on the strength of your money. You say poverty, but does a rich peasant live any better? He lives like a pig, too, excuse me, a clodhopper, a blusterer, a big-bellied blockhead with a swollen red mug makes me want to hit him in the eye, the blackguard. Look at Larian of Dubechnia. He is rich, but all the same he barks the trees in your woods, just like the poor, and he is a foul-mouthed brute, and his children are foul-mouthed, and when he is drunk he falls flat in the mud and goes to sleep. They are all worthless, my lady. It is just hell to live with them in the village. 
the village sticks in my gizzard, and I thank God, the King of Heaven, that I am well fed and clothed, and that I am a free man. I can live where I like. I don't want to live in the village, and nobody can force me to do it. They say, you have a wife. They say, you are obliged to live at home with your wife. Why? I have not sold myself to her. Tell me, Stepan, did you marry for love? asked Masha. What love is there in a village? Stepan answered with a smile. If you want to know, my lady, it is my second marriage. I do not come from Kurilovka, but from Zalagosh, and I went to Kurilovka when I married. My father did not want to divide the land up between us. There are five of us. So I bowed to it, and cut adrift, and went to another village, to my wife's family. My first wife died when she was young. What did she die of? Foolishness. She used to sit and cry. She was always crying for no reason, and so she wasted away. She used to drink herbs to make herself prettier, and it must have ruined her insides. And my second wife at Kurilovka, what about her? A village woman, a peasant, that's all. When the match was being made, I was nicely had. I thought she was young, nice to look at, and clean. Her mother was clean enough, drank coffee, and chiefly because they were a clean lot, I got married. Next day we sat down to dinner, and I told my mother-in-law to fetch me a spoon. She brought me a spoon, and I saw her wipe it with her finger. So that, thought I, is their cleanliness. I lived with them for a year, and went away. Perhaps I ought to have married a town girl, he went on after a silence. They say a wife is a helpmate to her husband. What do I want with a helpmate? I can look after myself but you talk to me sensibly and soberly, without giggling all the while. He, he, he! What is life without a good talk? Stepan suddenly stopped and relapsed into his dreary, monotonous yulululu. That meant that he had noticed me. Masha used often to visit the mill. She evidently took pleasure in her talks with Stepan. He abused the peasant so sincerely and convincingly, and this attracted her to him. When she returned from the mill, the idiot who looked after the garden used to shout after her, Paloshka, hello, Paloshka, and he would bark at her like a dog, bow, wow, and she would stop and stare at him as if she found in the idiot's barking an answer to her thought, and perhaps he attracted her as much as Stepan's abuse and at home she would find some unpleasant news awaiting her, as that the village geese had ruined the cabbages in the kitchen garden, or that Larian had stolen the reins, and she would shrug her shoulders with a smile and say, oh, "'What can you expect of such people?' She was exasperated, and a fury was gathering in her soul, and I, on the other hand, was getting used to the peasants, and more and more attracted to them. For the most part they were nervous, irritable, absurd people. They were people with suppressed imaginations, ignorant, with a bare, dull outlook, always dazed by the same thought of the grey earth, grey days, black bread. They were people driven to cunning, but like birds they only hid their heads behind the trees, they could not reason. They did not come to us for the twenty roubles earned by haymaking, but for the half-pail of vodka, though they could buy four pails of vodka for the twenty roubles. Indeed, they were dirty, drunken, and dishonest. But for all that, one felt that the peasant life as a whole was sound at the core. However clumsy and brutal the peasant might look as he followed his antiquated plough, and however he might fuddle himself with vodka, Still, looking at him more closely, one felt that there was something vital and important in him, something that was lacking in Masha and the doctor, for instance, namely that he believes that the chief thing on earth is truth, that his and everybody's salvation lies in truth, and therefore, above all else on earth, he loves justice. I used to say to my wife that she was seeing the stain on the window, but not the glass itself and she would be silent, or like Stepan, she would hum, oo When she, good clever actress that she was, went pale with fury, and then harangued the doctor in a trembling voice about drunkenness and dishonesty, 
her blindness confounded and appalled me. How could she forget that her father, the engineer, drank, drank heavily, and that the money with which he bought Dubechnia was acquired by means of a whole series of impudent, dishonest swindles? How could she forget? End of Part 13